Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I see a couple sweaters. It's a little chilly outside. <laughs> and I guess what the, they're telling me this whole day, it's going to warm up this week. So yeah. we'll have to enjoy the warmer weather because it's going to get colder again. Well, for those of you that are watching online, welcome to you as well. If you would please give us a shout out in the comments, let us know you're here. We'd really appreciate that. Just a few announcements this week. Our Bible study uh, on the Bible. That's kind of a tongue twister, or twist on the tongue there. Uh, it concludes this Wednesday night as we'll be showing the final episode of the Bible mini series. That's Wednesday night at 7, so join us for that. Then on Saturday, we'll have our September. Uh, yep, we'll have our September. <laughs> Orange Jack Racing, which will be the 14th. This, you know, the last few weeks we keep saying the 10th. It's the 14th. Registrations at 9.30, racing at 10, more at orangetrackracing.org. So uh, be sure to join us for that as we turn our sanctuary into a, a racetrack. So. And then with this series ending, a new series begins. So next Sunday, September 15th, we will be starting a sermon series based on season four, The Chosen. And just so that you know what's going on with that, we'll be showing the series starting on the 18th at seven o'clock right here as well. So join us for that. There are eight wonderful episodes starting off with promises and it is all about John the Baptist. So I invite you to join us for that. Then our next men's breakfast will be October 5th, 9 a.m. We had burritos and uh, some biscuits and gravy. I hear biscuits and gravy is returning, Denny, so you're good. Um, but it's but birthday week. It's his birthday. Oh. Yes, it is your birthday week, so we have to remember to get that biscuits and gravy. Might have to make a little extra so he has more to take home. We can put a bow on it. Okay. Just the thought. It works for me. Yeah. But the rest of the menu is still in, in flux. We like to shake things up. I heard mention of potentiality of pancakes and frittatas and waffles. and So we just... There's going to be good food, so please be join, sure to join us. That's October 5th at 9 a.m. And then for those of you that are watching online, if you go to gracestreet.church and click on messages or just click the link in uh, the feed there, you can then listen to the music that has been curated to go along with today's message, along with a trailer to the season four of The Chosen. With that... Let's call my hearts and prepare for worship this morning with this morning's call to worship. Gracious Lord, we just thank you for the day that you've given us. We thank you for our friends, for our family, for our church family. We thank you for the many blessings that you give to us. And even though sometimes, Father, it doesn't always seem like you're walking with us, you are always there. You never disappear. Even as we saw last week, Jesus died on the cross. You have never forgotten us. You continue to be with us. And with the Jesus going to be with you at your right hand, you sent the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit's presence this morning and that each of our hearts would be opened, each of our minds would be opened, our eyes would be opened, our ears would be opened to hear the message that you have for us this morning. Father, teach us what's next. In Jesus' name, amen. The call to worship this morning comes from John 21, 25. It says, and there are also many things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, as I thought about that, I'm a book lover. I have more books than I know what to do with. Diane can attest to that. I have books upon books upon books and more books. I probably have a total of 3,000 plus actual physical books. I love books. I've been collecting since I was, we have, since I read that first book to my mom. And she grabbed it after I finished it and went like this. I said, let's try it again. But I thought, we're in an age of computers. 
And I have to imagine, even with all the data centers, even the one that's being built south of town, there would not be enough data centers for the internet that could contain everything that could be written about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because you have to remember it goes beyond that three year period. It goes beyond his 33 years here on earth. He's been here uh, since eternity and he will be around until eternity. In this passage here, it's really John, he's kind of tying up some loose ends. But he's also pointing to the church's growth and, and the diversity of the gifts and callings through this chapter. And John, all he could do is give us a highlight reel. And that's, this is him giving us that final summary of that highlight reel. This is what Jesus did for us. And is it an exaggeration that the world could not contain it? I don't really think so. Our historical knowledge of Jesus is best at partial. But the good news is, which we read right in here, is that we've been given all that we need. We don't need to know everything that Jesus did and said. But John says, you do need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah by believing that you have his name in you. Father, as we invite Pastor Mark up here to bring us our message this morning on what's next, we just thank you that you continue to give us the teachings and the words that we need to continue living a life that is pleasing to you. But even though we make mistakes and we do sin, Father, by your grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness, we are made righteous in your eyes. And that is why your son took on the punishment that we should have. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. How's everyone this morning? Isn't that a great day? Who could want better weather than what we've had here lately? It is awesome. Because this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You guys are all sitting here like this this morning. <laughs> I'm looking at these faces going, hurry up and get this over with. I want to get out there. So, um, But really, truly, we have a great opportunity in here. We had a great movie last night, and one of the key points uh, that I talked about last night was, you know, uh, one of the points, because it wasn't really a biblical-based movie, per se, um, but I thought when Morgan Freeman, acting as God, made some points last night about praying, sometimes we don't get what we pray for, but God presents us with an opportunity to learn for what we prayed about and to build our lives differently from that. So sometimes we ask for something, God gives it to us, but just in a little different form than what we had asked for. And so as we come through this and, and we think about uh, what happened next, because today's topic is what happened next? So last week we had Jesus died on the cross and then the he rose from the dead, but what happened next? Can you imagine what the disciples were going through at that point in time? Here they come, they've, they've followed Jesus this whole time. He dies on the cross, not exactly what they were expecting. The people that were following Jesus outside of the disciples and the apostles, they were going, hey, what's next? You know, what's, what's going on? You know, this is the end? Well, not quite. So in the Bible miniseries here, we're at episode 10, which is the last episode in here. And so I decided, I said, okay, well, what happened next? And so the reason I chose John 21, 25 this morning, because if we think about it, and we think about all of the books that have been written since Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead, how many books do you think have been written? Yeah. 
And so was John far off when he says, I suppose even that the world itself could not contain all the books that could be written. The books are still being written today. 2,000 years later, there's still books being written on it. And we were having a good discussion this morning, Doug and I were, about a friend of my father's who was born and raised over in the Middle East and came to uh, America. And so his perspective, which really taught me a lot, his perspective on what is said in the Bible and why is completely different from what we read on the pages. And that's why I try and interject a few things here and there about what I learned from him. But what happened next over in there and what went on culturally, societally over there makes a big difference. So when I say what happened next, well, a lot happened in the last few episodes of the miniseries in here. And now we have the ability to have the rest of the story. I love Paul Harvey, so what can I say? But we, we have the rest of the story. So Jesus uttered those words from the cross and he says, it is finished. So Satan, he thought he had won. Satan thought, hey, hey, I, I won this battle. He's, he's dead, it's all over, it's, it's all done. Well, the Jewish high council thought they won because this Jewish guy, this Jesus, he was out of their hair and they could resume business as normal. And the Romans thought, okay, this, this instigator, he's gone. So they thought they had won. It was all over now, right? Or was it? Well, they found out that no, nothing was over. It was just the beginning. It was just the beginning because what happened next in the next well, we'll just call it the next 50 days, were truly, truly amazing. So three days after Jesus, after the death of Jesus. And so what I want to do today is I'm going to take you from that point of what happened then all the way up to Pentecost. Now that's 50 days worth of, of a period in there. Penta meaning five, 50. Pentecost. But Pentecost, well, we'll get to that in a little while. Uh, but three days after Jesus died, what happened? Well, during those three days of Jesus, many different things took place. Number one, we had the resurrection. And Jesus rose from the dead, an earthquake shook and hit. An angel of the Lord rolled the stone door away and then sat on it. The Roman guards witnessed all of this event, as was written in the, in the records. Matthew records it this way in 28, 1 through 4. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat on it. His countenance was like lightning in his clothes, white as snow, and the guards shook in fear of him and became like dead men. So here we have a, an event that took place. Now, who caused this to happen? What caused that earthquake to sh shake? Who sent the angel down from heaven to roll back the stone? And, and see, the thing about it is, a lot of people miss the point. The stone was rolled back so that we could see that he wasn't in there. Not so he could get out. He was already gone. He was already gone by that time. He had sent the angel down to prove that he had arisen. So then what do we get next? We get the angel announcement. That happened next. When Mary Magdalene and the other women arrived at the tomb to anoint the body with spices, they were met by an angel. The angel told them that Jesus had risen. The angel also instructed them to tell the disciples what they had seen. And we find that in Matthew 28, 5 through 8. But really, listen to what, what happened there. The angel told them that Jesus had risen. And the angel instructed them to tell the disciples what they had seen. See, this wasn't a coincidence. This was all part of the plan. This was all part of what needed to be revealed, God's plan revealed to the people so that they would understand what actually happened at this point. 
Matthew records it this way, but the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. Well, he is not there for he is risen as he had said. So he is they're here they're telling him, here we see what Jesus said. He says, now just as Jesus said, he is risen from the dead. His temple was rebuilt in three days. Come and see the place where the Lord lay and quickly and go tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to spread the disciples his words. So when we see this, we see a, an affirmation of what Jesus said before he was crucified and died. And now we know that it has come to pass because the angel came down from heaven and said, just as he said, this is exactly what he did. So it's an affirmation of he was who he said he was and he was going to do what he said he was going to do. So we need to understand as we're reading these passages, there's more to the story than just the words on the page. This is an affirmation of his ministry in progress. So then Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene was our next point that happened. And as Mary sat weeping at the tomb, Jesus appeared to her. And then afterwards, she ran to tell the disciples what she had seen. So John records it this way in 20, 11 through 18. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus was laying. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have taken him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is to say teacher, because she had spent all that time with him, but didn't recognize him. He was not revealing himself yet to people. She was the first that he had revealed that he had risen. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not ascended to my Father, but go to my brother and say them, to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So here we see a lot going on in there. Now, in the biblical sense, in the biblical times, the women did not have a place in society and an ability to actually speak to elders whatsoever. It was only the men. But Jesus didn't come here to keep things the way they were within society. What did he do? He said he was here to shake things up. He was going to change the way things were. What did he say in Matthew when he was given the Beatitudes? Do you remember that? Ah. Go back and read. I'm not going to tell you. you got to look it up for yourselves. I love this. But here we see, you know, the least is no longer the least in society. The women and the children were not counted. So when they were counting the 5,000, they counted men only. Women and children weren't counted. So the least now are no longer the least. He has raised them up. He's turned the tables. Read the rest of Matthew. So next what happened is the disciples and Peter and John raced to the tomb. And upon driving, they found just as the woman had said that Jesus had in fact risen from the dead. And John 20, 3 through, uh, 3 through 10 says, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. 
and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Now, understand who ran to the tomb? Well, it was Peter and John. So is there any rivalry between them? Well, John's writing this, so, you know, maybe, maybe, okay. So they both ran to the tomb. The other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, and yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and they saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. So here we see that they again were underwritten what Jesus had told them was going to happen. And what did we hear in there? Now these are the people that ate, slept, drank, walked, listened to the ministry day by day. But what did he say in here? The other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. He saw and believed. He saw and believed. So here we see an affirmation of Jesus' ministry again. And I wanted to point these things out. I'm not going to go through every day in the process in here, but these are the things that are very important for us to understand what we just went through in the other ten episodes from Jesus' birth up until his death on the cross. His ministry time that he had is affirmed then in these events of those first three days. That's why the first three days are so very important. What happened next then? Well, the guards, we have those Roman guards, remember? Now the Roman guards are guarding the tomb and they are under penalty of death. Should anyone get into that tomb or disturb it, they are there, number one, to protect it, but also they are there for their lives because if, if something happened, yeah, pretty much in Roman rule, you died, you're gone. You didn't, you didn't happen to uh, survive what was going to happen next. So when the guards witnessed these events, they reported not to the Roman authorities. Why is that? Because they were going, okay, well, the guy that we're guarding is gone. We have no idea what happened. We have no idea where he went. So instead, they went to the chief priests, then who instructed them to spread a false narrative of theft by the disciples attempting to conceal the truth. So Matthew 28, 11 through 15 says, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all of the things that had happened. Notice what they say here. All of the things that happened. So the chief priests knew exactly what was going on. When they had assembled with the elders, they consulted together. They gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So they bought these guys off for their silence and they said, don't worry about it, we'll make sure that the Roman authorities don't kill you, but we want this narrative because that supports who we are, not who he was. They were still wanting to maintain that control. They were still wanting to be subjugated under the law and so they did not want this to change. So they changed the narrative instead. We see that happening a lot in today's society as well. We won't go there, but I just did. So, 40 days after the resurrection of Jesus, and we're going to take a look at the, the next part of the story. So after the resur resurrection of Jesus, he appeared to many people in different ways and in various places before his final ascension into heaven. 
His appearances took place then over this 40 day period. So first we have the road to Emmaus. Two of Jesus' followers left Jerusalem to return home to Emmaus and on the way they were met by Jesus. However, they did not recognize him at first. And as we remember that story in Luke 24, they talk about how how they walked along and he talked to them and he taught them so so much and with so much authority they they, they couldn't get enough of him, so they invited him to dinner that night. And then at the dinner, after they had finished their dinner, Jesus revealed himself to them and who he was. And Jesus left them and returned to Jerusalem to tell the disciples what they had seen. And we find that in Luke 24, 13 to 35. I don't have time enough to read all the scriptures today. So I had to chop some things out because I was over 3,800 words when I, I did this. I'm like, ooh, I've got to scale back. Um, but it's a great story because they said, didn't our hearts burn us that they were on fire when he was telling us these things and teaching us? And when the Holy Spirit comes upon that person, what is one of the first things that happens? You feel a warmth throughout your entire body. The, the, the experience has been... Uh, well documented for years and years and years. And so Jesus in there in, in his presence with them, they felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now understand, after they went back to Jerusalem and had waited, because I, I told you about that several sermons ago, that Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come upon them, to empower them, and to equip them to go ahead and go out and do the ministry work. So, I jumped ahead. So then Jesus comes back and he appears to 10 disciples. And we find this in John 20, 19 through 25. And as the disciples gathered together, everyone except Thomas was there and Jesus appeared to them. And they saw him, the scripture tells us in there that they saw him and believed. All right? So did they not believe prior to that? No, but they believed that he had indeed risen from the dead. Again, reaffirming what he had told them at the Last Supper. Okay? So next what happens is Jesus appears to 11 disciples. Now remember, we only have 11 because Judas went out and hanged himself. This time when Jesus appeared to the disciples, Thomas was there. But what he said was, what? He says, I'm not going to believe until I place my fingers inside the piercings and inside your side. And once he did, he then believed. And Jesus told him then, what? He says, blessed are those who believe and yet don't see. You don't have to be proved to believe it. So uh, Thomas was there and then he felt Jesus' hands inside in John 20. 26 through 30. So if you guys you know, wanted to, there's red books back there. Just raise your hand, somebody will bring you one. So what happens next then is Jesus appeared to seven of the disciples. And while the seven disciples were at the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, that section down there, uh, Jesus appeared to them and they had a meal together and Peter was given them special instructions on how to send the disciples out and where to go. And he, he sent them out in a particular area, in a particular order, so that they could minister to the groups of people that were in those areas. They knew them culturally, so they could speak to them and be recognized and had the ministry accepted. So they had that meal together, and Peter was given those special instructions, and he had, he had become kind of that guy that, that he was asking Jesus, you know, hey, I want to be number one, I want to be number one. So here Jesus is saying, okay, now is your opportunity, now is your time to lead. Okay, John 21, 1 through 19. Then Jesus appeared to others, is what they say in, the, in this section in here in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. It says, after appearing several times to the disciples, Jesus appeared to a crowd of over 500 at this point in time. Now, everybody, as you're going through here, the, the, the scriptures and the gospels talk about the disciples. And you had this small group of disciples in here. You had the 12, right? 
but there were many, 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 many more than that. If you read in Matthew in there, it talks about sending out the 97 at one point in time. Um, because he had more disciples than just the 12. So I just want everybody to understand. But here Jesus appears to a crowd of over 500 in 1 Corinthians. And then what happens after that is Jesus gives the Great Commission then. And later when Jesus appeared to the 11, he instructed them to preach the gospel and to disciple others. In other words, to teach them as they had been taught to disciple. That's what it means to disciple. So he instructed them to preach the gospel and to disciple others. And he also instructed them to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. We find that in Mark 16, 14 through 18 and Acts 1 through 18. And we, we see this in here and Jesus is waiting them so that they can be properly equipped to go and grow and grow the people out here in knowledge, in discipling them, in teaching them what Jesus had taught them. Which was what? It was a complete different way of life. It was a different way to be God's people, other than what they had brought up with in Jewish society up to that point. They were all subjugated under the law, if we remember all the laws that they had. They were subjugated under the laws, but Jesus came and he fulfilled the laws. So they were no longer subjugated to those. But he also taught them how to be a godly people, how to act and interact with each other, how to be servants rather than to expect to be served by others, but to go and serve other people and to love one another as yourselves. Okay? So he taught them a different way of being people being the people that God wanted to be, the godly people. So if you remember when I was talking about the Ten Commandments that we got way, 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 way back in the Old Testament, we got those Ten Commandments, and it wasn't so you had this set of rules that you were just beaten down upon, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. What it was, it was a set of instructions on, hey, I want you to be a godly people and to be able to live together peacefully with one another. That's what the whole Ten Commandments is about. Don't kill each other. Don't tell lies about each other. Don't have other false gods that would lead you astray from me. I want to have a good relationship with you. That's what the Ten Commandments were all about. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Okay? So what happened next? The next big event was the ascension. Was the ascension. After Jesus gave his disciples those final dis instructions then, he ascended into heaven, Acts 1, 9 through 11. Now during this whole time, we had the disciples who had been taught by Jesus, who had been talking to other people. They were afraid to go out, so he sent the Holy Spirit upon them to anoint them, to empower them, to edify them, to lift them up in the Spirit, and so that the Spirit would guide them as they went out to disciple others. So when we take a look at these things, yeah, the, the, the cross was not the end of the story. It was not finished. That was the beginning. This was the birth of the revolution of Jesus' ministry. It just, it really, truly just began. So what happened during this whole time was the disciples were journaling. They were writing things down. Now, in traditional, if you take a look at traditional times, uh, this is one of the things I learned from Nat, uh, is that they actually journaled a lot of these things so that they could go back and recount them. Now, the book of Mark, we talked about that this morning. The book of Mark was written 40 years after Jesus' death on the cross. So he was the first book, he wrote his book first, and then the others, Luke, and the others followed. Luke was a compatriot of John Mark, commonly called Mark, because we had a lot of Johns back in that day, I guess. Um, but Luke was a compatriot of Mark, and he was also a follower of Paul. So therefore, he went back through and recounted that story in the book of Luke. 
And that's where we get that. So if you notice, the book of Luke and the book of Mark are, are kind of conjoined together because they were compatriots. And so you have a lot of the same things written. So during this time, uh, following Jesus' death, we have the, the scripture writing journals that happened in those times, and those journals were written by the apostles. Now, not to say what we read today is a compilation of the Gospels, but journals more as a way to remember so that they could compile these things and write their Gospels later on. So now, we have seven days after the ascension of Jesus, what happens? While well, rounding out those seven days between the death of Jesus and Pentecost, that 50-day period after Jesus ascended, his disciples gathered together in Jerusalem in preparation for the Feast of Pentecost. Now, a lot of people go, well, wait a minute, Pentecost is that 50-day period, right? Well, no, no, no. See, that was a feast that was started 1,500 years before by Moses. So that Feast of Pentecost was a long time. Do we have a graphic? There we go. There we go. So here's the really, really neat thing that I learned from Nat Cycli. Um, the events of the New Testament occurred precisely on the three spring festivals of the Old Testament. Jesus was crucified when? Passover. So if we look at the, if we look at the events of the Old Testament and what happened when, which is on the bottom down here, we have the Sabbath rest. Of course, I stand in front of you. You can't see it, sorry. So, but if we take a look at it, we see exactly the weekly progression of what happens. Jesus' resurrection is on the first fruits, that first harvest following the Passover, where they brought the grain offerings in because that's all they had at the time. So that was our first fruits that started back then. That was Jesus' resurrection when he was raised from the dead. And we have that all the way out through that 50 week. He's, Moses said during there, we are going to have a seven week period, a full seven weeks. So if we count that off, we have 50 days in that seven weeks. And then we have the Feast of Weeks that uh, happened there at that 50th day. And what happens on the 50th day? The Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost. What happens on Pentecost? Well, Pentecost was actually that Old Testament festival that happened back there. Started 1,500 years before Jesus was on the earth. And it had established several festivals to celebrate throughout the year to, for the people to understand and remember certain things. So the festivals were periods of time that the Jewish people were to remember those special events that had happened during that point in time, back in the Old Testament times. Jesus had been crucified on a Passover day festival. The exact timing of his death to the sacrifices of the Passover was meant to be, because if you remember at the Passover, what did they do? They slaughtered an innocent lamb and took the blood and put it on the mantles of the door so that the the spirit of death would pass them by so jesus was crucified on that same day so what do we have here we have the blood of an innocent lamb shed for those and for the forgiveness of sin as a final atonement no more blood sacrifices were necessary. This is why this is so important. The timings on these are no accident. These happened exactly the way that God had planned them to do 1,500 years before. So that second festival was the Festival of Fruits. The Law of Moses commanded its celebration on the day after Passover Sunday. Jesus rose on Sunday, so his resurrection occurred exactly on the First Fruits Festival. Since his resurrection happened on First Fruits, it promised that our resurrection would follow later for all of those who believed in him. Jesus' resurrection is literally a First Fruits, just as the scriptures and the festival name had prophesied 1,500 years. 
Then, precisely 50 days after the first fruit Sunday, the Jews celebrated Pentecost, Penta meaning 50. It was also called the Feast of Weeks since it was counted by seven weeks. Exactly seven weeks happened in there. Thus the Festival of Weeks. The Jews had been celebrating Pentecost for 1,500 years by the time Pentecost recounted in Acts 2 happened. The reason that there were people from all over the world is that Pentecost day in Jerusalem to hear Peter's message when they all gathered together in there was precisely because they were there to celebrate that Old Testament Pentecost time when they gathered together for that Feast of Weeks. So then what happened? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, today Jews still celebrate Pentecost, but they call it Shabbat. Okay, we're all caught up on history now. So now let's get back to the disciples, shall we? So we come to the next big event, which was the giving out of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples and those with them, and they immediately began telling others about Jesus. They spoke in many tongues, and that is languages not of their own. Not of their own. They had been empowered to go in all the world and tell them people just as <coughs> Jesus had told them. Okay, so I want you to hold on to that thought. Hold on to that thought. They spoke in many languages, many tongues, languages not of their own. So they were empowered by the Holy Spirit to go and what did Jesus uh, commission them to do? Go into all the world, make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and I won't go through all that today. But So for us today, unfortunately, we celebrate Easter and then move on without realizing that the story didn't end with the resurrection. We get so wrapped up in that Easter Sunday that we forget that there's a lot of things that happened in the meantime. And the day of Pentecost always comes on a Sunday, so it kind of comes and goes for us because we don't celebrate those festivals. We don't take the time to remember the importance of what happened. Now that graphic today, I hope, sparks some people. And if we need to, I'll, I'll print off the graphic so you can have it. But it's important not only what happened that day, but when and why it happened that reveals the hand of God in all of this that was done throughout all time. And it's still in today, in today's world, it is still important that we understand and realize and recognize the hand of God in all of these things. It also offers a powerful gift to you, and here's why. During that 50 days after Jesus' death, he had many, many interactions with his disciples and other followers, providing them with guidance and encouragement to go out there. If we remember after Jesus was, was arrested and everything, they, the disciples, they, said they scattered out of fear. They were in fear for their lives because they figured they were going to be hanging on the cross next. And they were in fear for their lives. But once the Holy Spirit empowered them, there was no more fear. Because what replaces fear? Faith. Faith. Faith replaces fear every time. So then the Holy Spirit came upon them and provided them guidance and encouragement. And what happened on Pentecost Sunday? Well, we just got done learning all there is to know about Pentecost, right? So you probably learned that it was the day when the Holy Spirit came to indwell in the followers of Jesus, not just the disciples, but all that were gathered there because they were here because they wanted to hear Jesus' message proclaimed to them by the disciples. So, the Holy Spirit came to indwell on the followers of Jesus, and this was to fulfill what was promised to them. But the other really significant thing, especially for us, is this is the day that the church, the ones who were called out, the ones of God that were called out of the people, see, that was the day the church was born. That was the day the church was born. Second Acts of the chapter, then the Bible records this event, Acts 2, 36 um, through 47. 
Therefore, let all the houses of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And as we remember from uh, my last mention when I talked about that, his name was not Jesus Christ. He was Jesus the Christ, meaning Jesus the Savior, the one that atones for sin. That's what the Christ means. So he was coming, Jesus was coming as that atonement, that last and final sacrifice, blood sacrifice, from a couple minutes ago. See how all this makes sense? Sure. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Man and brother, what should we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, here they are, they're, they're given that promise ahead of time. And now the promise is fulfilled. For the promise is to you and to your children, to all who are far off, and as many as the Lord God will call. And with other many words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his words were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone who had need. So continually, daily, uh, with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of their hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church the daily those who were being saved. Now in our movie last night, I talked about how God took this guy who, Evan, right? And he was so focused on all of the trappings of the world had the big car, big fancy house. He had all of the trappings that he thought were important in life. And what did God do? He kind of shaved all those off really cool. <laughs> Didn't really shave them. Made him grow the beard, wouldn't shave away. Oh, I like that. So God took all the way, all of those trappings away from him and really truly showed him what was important and what was important that God wanted to establish that relationship, not only back with his family, but who else? Who else? He established that connection back to God's creation. So that was kind of a big message in the movie. Hopefully it didn't go to waste on anybody last night. But what else happened in the process? He reassembled, restored that relationship with God in the process. A lot of different things. It wasn't a biblical movie. I'll say it again. But it had some really good theological messages captured within it. So here we see the same thing being here. The people were giving away the trappings of the world and they were communing with one another as God's people in the breaking of the bread and the serving of the cup in remembrance of what Jesus had done for them, that atonement that he did. And on that day, that day of Pentecost then, the Spirit of God descended on the first 120 followers of Jesus. Not just the disciples, but the first 120 followers of Jesus. Then they started proclaiming loudly in languages from around the world. It created such a commotion that thousands in Jerusalem at the time came out to see what was happening. And then in front of the gathered crowd, Peter spoke the first gospel message ever given. He got up there and he gave a sermon. Not as long as the one I get, no. Uh, his, his sermon was very quite long. But the account records that in 3,000 were added to the number that day, Acts 2.41. The number of gospel followers that have been growing ever since that Pentecost Sunday, now the best part, over 3,000 then were filled with the Holy Spirit. So they became emboldened, they became empowered, they became able to go out and proclaim the good news to even more, how fast is the church growing at this point? 
They were from all of the regions surrounding Jerusalem. Now, does that fact that they were speaking in tongues make sense? Languages not of their own, because that's what tongues means. Languages not of their own. So they were able to go out and minister and disciple to people who didn't speak the same language that is their native language. That is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This was the work of God kick-starting the foundation of the church for you and for me today. That happened 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. It was during the 50 days that Jesus' disciples became convinced that Jesus had indeed been raised from the dead. See, if they didn't own that, if they didn't take ownership that he had indeed been raised, they can't go out and give a good presentation to someone else with conviction that said, yes, I am committed to the fact that he did indeed raise from the dead. That is the basis for our entire belief system, is that Jesus was raised from the dead. No other religion in the world has that except for Christianity. So whether you believe in the resurrection or not, the events of Pentecost Sunday have affected your life 2,024 years later. And that is why it's so significant. If nothing else, nothing else. We can't stop at Easter and call it good after that. That's when the real fun begins. See what the C and E's are missing? I call them C and E's. Christmas and Easter's, they only show up a couple times a year. They're missing out on all the rest of the fun. When we started Grace Street Church, I started in and we would celebrate with a meal in here up until COVID hit. Uh, we would celebrate the different festivals throughout the year and we would have either breakfast or something like that in there. I really think we need to get back to that because there's meaning behind it, as you can see in that graphic that we had today. Okay, so all's well and good, right? But there's more to the story. A little bit more. A little bit more. After Jesus' death and as the Romans were feeling threatened by this growing church then, Remember, they're still in charge. Fueled by those actions of the apostles and those who, that they had converted, they were growing by thousands and thousands. And pressure was put on the Jewish high council to keep things under control. But guess what? They had no control over these people. If we read chapter 7 of Acts, we find that the story of Stephen. And Stephen, who was a devout follower of Jesus, called out a group of Pharisees who had gathered as he was speaking and using the scriptures and he was really making the Pharisees look very bad to that gathered crowd that they had gathered together so Saul belittles and berated we we have the appearance then in chapter 7 of Acts of Saul of Tarsus not King Saul we had that in the trivia earlier today he was the guy that chased around David remember okay I, I digress okay so here Stephen is calling out this group of Pharisees um, for what? Being hypocrites, right? Not following, saying one thing and doing another. So Saul then belittles and berated Stephen, called him a blasphemer, and cited those gathered together then to stone Stephen to death. And following the stoning of Stephen, Saul was brought before the council, the high council. They're going, hey, here's a, here's a guy that we can use as a tool. Sound familiar? Yeah. Same thing they did with who? Judas. Judas, exactly, exactly. So now Saul of Tarsus was himself a Pharisee and was given authority then by Caiaphas. Remember Caiaphas? He's the great guy, right? And the council then to seek out and destroy anyone who professed the name of Jesus Christ. And he did just that. They were beaten and jailed and even stoned to death. All in the name of God, or so he thought at the time. Now we're going to jump ahead to Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 18. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anybody who were of the way, remember what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, so those who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound, then, bound in shackles to Jerusalem, 
And as he journeyed, came near Damascus, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground. And he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And as he was there three days without sight, he neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and he said to uh, and oh, I'm sorry, and said to him the Lord in a vision said to Ananias he said here I am Lord so the Lord said to him arise and go to a street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus for behold he is praying now on another he is praying to me now is what the footnote had said and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many things about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. So if we notice, he was baptized by the Spirit and water. Why is that important? Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? You must be born again of the Spirit and of water in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Saul, now Paul, because he's changed, behold you are made new, Okay, set out with a new mission. But this time, it was a mission from God himself. He fervently went out to preach in the synagogues and temples to anyone who would listen. He was making a great impact because he spoke with, remember what I talked about a few minutes ago, he spoke with authority. He spoke with conviction to anyone who would listen. <clears throat> so even the high council themselves dared not stop him. He was one of their own. Now, this did not mean that he did not suffer. Remember what, what was written in the scripture in there? Yeah. Uh, I will show him how many things he must suffer by, for my name's sake. So, he was subjugated to the very things he had done to the early Christians himself. This fulfilled what Jesus had spoken to Ananias about. And as Paul, he was writing letters of encouragement, letters of discipline to the early churches. These letters make up half of the New Testament. These letters predate the Gospels written by the Apostles by about 35 to 40 years. And remember I told you about all the journaling that went on. This is where the epistles of Paul come from. Okay? The rest of the story, remember? The Gospel of Mark being the first to be written approximately 40 A.D., as the persecution of the apostles increased, they were one by one being killed to try and stop the church. James being the first one to be beheaded and John being the last was poisoned. But in the process of being poisoned, they failed to kill him, but instead exiled him to the island of Patmos where he spent the remainder of his days, writing the rest of his books and the book of Revelation. 
An excerpt from the Bible uh, archaeological writings say this, We are not told of how long he was on Patmos for the word of God and the great testimony, but he was a very aged man. But it may well, may well have been a year or more. Patmos is a very rocky island off the coast of Turkey. The sun beats down on it, and it is very, very hot there, and it is hard to, for anything to survive. Nothing grows well on Patmos whatsoever. The Roman Emperor Dominiatin thought that he had silenced John, but from that place the Lord had given us the book about the scriptures without it would not be complete. We're not told of the order of John's five books that he actually wrote, although we find his commission to write in the book of Revelation. I don't know, but it might have been wrote that he had these other writings afterwards. All the evidence shows that all his books were written when he was a very aged man. The Revelation of John presents to us the ultimate victory of the Lord Jesus when all things in the world and in the professing church seem so very bad. Indeed, we're getting absolutely worse day by day. It's a great encouragement to see that the final outcome no matter what, it's going to be wonderful. It will be triumphant, and it will be all to God's glory. Scripture would not be complete without the revelation of John, because he gives us the rest of the story. As a reflection on the life and times of Jesus and his apostles, where would we, today, where would we be today without him and without them? In John, it was written in 21, 25. And there are also many other things that Jesus did. And if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the whole world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you today with the humbleness of heart. We've all messed up and fallen short of the glory of God. But you assure us that that's not where we have to stay lost in a lost world. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your unending love and forgiveness. Help us to be strong in you, strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and brings us to your glory. Restore us, reconcile us, redeem us today, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your holy name today. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> That was the rest of the story. <laughs> the uh, timeline, by the way, Pastor Terry did a miracle while I was speaking, and it is now on the back table. No, that was that was the game last night. That was just simply copy paste print. <laughs> I can't hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Everything that happened in those days after Jesus' resurrection is a culmination of what we are about to partake in. Knowing what was about to happen, Jesus spent time with his disciples. They prayed, they worshiped, they ate. Jesus washed their feet, including Judas. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took the bread and after breaking it, he said, this is my body, broken for you, take and eat. Later in the meal, after having eaten and maybe singing some hymns, he took the cup and filled it, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the sins of many, take and drink. Scripture tells us that as often as we do so, we are to do so till Christ's return. And as much as we want Christ to return, we have to know that it is in God's time, not ours. God knows the perfect time. He knew the perfect time to send his son 
the first time, he knows the perfect time to send him the final time. Body of Christ broken for you. Take it easy. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Father God, you have blessed us so greatly with this one act of sending your son to die on the cross for us. And what John said is, I don't believe in exaggeration for everything that your son has done from eternity to eternity, including this time here on earth, could not be contained in any book or any database. Thank you for this precious gift. In Jesus' name, amen. time for prayers for the people. If anyone would like prayers, just let me know. We've got a lot to pray for this morning. And Okay, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, as we prepare our hearts to pray for others this morning, I want to invite the Holy Spirit to rest on everyone in this church today who are here and online. Let your word resonate with them so they feel your presence and know you are God. For as it states in Psalms 121, 1 and 3, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. This means there is nowhere we can go to hide from your presence. You watch over us day and night. When we walk through the trials in life, you are there guiding us along. When we are in the pit of despair, you hold us close and pull us up and sit us level on level ground. You meet us at the foot of the cross where we cast all our cares onto you today so that we may be blessed by the blood and set free by your spirit to live and a healthier and clean life according to your will for us, Lord Jesus. And Father God, today we lift up all the families that are trying to pick up the pieces of their lives after the senseless shootings in Georgia in the Appalachia High School this week. You know their needs, Father God. We ask for mercy and grace in the healing and mental and physical aspects of their lives. We plead with you, Father, to intercede the evil one before they attack our children and their teachers. Bring the Ten Commandments back into schools all across America so children can learn your decrees even if they are not taught by their parents. Let your words spread like wildfire throughout the nation. The evil one comes to seek, kill, and destroy all lives. Help us to be a people of prayer to guard against the evil attacks in this world. As Ephesians 6 and 10 and 12, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Father God, you will fight for us if we call on you to act through prayer and petition. We believe and trust you because you are faithful to your word and your deed. Father God, we lift up all who are here and online suffering from all kinds of ailments, cancer or disease and mental illness. We call upon you in their time of need and ask you to cover them with the blood of Jesus who bore our sins on the cross, died and rose three days later to take away the sins of the world. We beseech you today to fight the battles for us so that we all may stand and proclaim your mighty works to an unbelieving world. Let the world see that you still perform miraculous works today. For you are the same great God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So help all to call upon your holy name, and may their lives be transformed by your mighty power. Help us all to confess that you alone are God. 
You are the eternal God, El Olam. There is no other God like you. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are and all that you do for us. Father God, we lift up Charlie and his family. Father, we ask that you find a way to bring your presence into this family, for you work all things together for our good. Let peace abound around the family, within the family, and through all that they do. Surround them with your presence like a hedge of protection. Help them to bring you into their family and let you be their guide. Please find the way to reach them and intervene and restore and renew their lives. I lift up Matt to you, Father God. I pray that you will walk with him this week in the trial he faces. Bring him through it successfully and restore his family back to you, Lord Jesus. And Father God, we pray for guidance for our children, grandchildren, and for the homeless communities all across this nation. We pray that they learn respect for themselves and for others. Help them to learn and put into practice the second great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. If people learn your decree while they are young, we can all live together in peace as they get older. We need you, Jesus. Please do not leave America or forsake us. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. amen. Thank you, Denise. You know, I, I'm just in awe of God and his works because your prayers were written without even knowing anything about my message today, and yet it echoed exactly what was said. Yep. God is good. God is good. All the time. So as we come into our uh, end of our service here today, our online service today, I invite you to click on the link and listen to the songs that were curated to go along with this message. Uh, because... God's love is extravagant, and we saw that on the cross. God's love is there for us each and every day, and we just need to call out to his name. And as we do, we get a new anointing into his presence. And we are sent forth into the world until the whole world hears. To hear that message, we have a commission to go into all the world and make disciples of all peoples in the name of Christ. So receive this blessing today. Dear Lord, help us to do our very best each day to affirm one another and to remove the barriers that seem to hinder our relationships and keep us at a distance from one another. Please give us your grace to heal our short tempers, our destructive habits. Help us to let go of the grudges that we hold on to so tightly. Inspire us, dear God, to be re-gifters of your grace and your mercy, your blessings and your love. Lead us then to be vessels and ambassadors of your forgiveness and of your healing love and of your wisdom, Lord. Loving and gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us so that we will have the courage to reach out to those who have offended or hurt us, those who would do us wrong in this world, and ask that they would be blessed in the process. With your inspiration, Heavenly Father, may our efforts to heal the wounds that hurt our families hurt our churches, and hurt our world. Let them be reconciled to you, Lord God. Lead our hearts to worship you more fully each and every day. Bless us, dear God, that we may have hearts full of your peace instead of strife, instead of stress, instead of hatred, instead of hurt. May we strive to be reconciled to you and to one another Help us to always remember and live by the words that Jesus shared with his disciples when he taught them to pray. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 